Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming along. Tonight we have uh, Dr. Ruth Fitzpatrick from the All Ireland Pollinator Plan to tell us all about the great work they've been doing and and uh, are planning to do. Um, and if you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A, and we'll address them after the talk. This talk is being recorded. I hope that's okay with everybody. So, thank you. Hand over to you. Thanks, Brendan. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm delighted to get a chance to chat to you all this evening. I'll try to share my screen first. You can let me know if this looks okay. Does that look okay from your side? Yep, uh, perfect. Perfect. Great. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so yeah, and no, I'm delighted to get a chance to, I suppose, update you maybe on the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. I'm just going to tell you a wee bit about about the plan, about the things we've been achieving in the first phase, and then the types of things that we want to try and achieve in this new five-year phase that we've just started. Um, you, you probably know I work in the National Biodiversity Data Centre, where we manage information on Ireland's wildlife, and we've got amazing biodiversity in Ireland. You know, there's 31 and a half thousand different species living in 117 different habitats. But I think we all know, unfortunately, at this stage, that biodiversity loss is a huge problem. And I always think it, it's hard to feel empowered to do anything about that, you know, as individuals, because biodiversity itself is so complex. So what can be really useful is to identify simple vehicles that can be used to sell a biodiversity, biodiversity message to a very wide audience. And thankfully, pollinators are perfect for this. So they're an element of biodiversity that people can understand and relate to. You can communicate about pollinators in a really clean and simple way. You can easily monitor changes. And probably most importantly, when you protect pollinators, that has knock-on benefits for biodiversity generally. Unfortunately, you know, I think probably as we all know, the, the plight of pollinators is typical of what's happening right across our biodiversity. So in Ireland, we've got 100 bees, there's the honeybee, but then we have 21 bumblebees and 78 solitary bee species. And unfortunately, of those 99 wild bees, one third are threatened with extinction, you know, which is a huge number. Even more worryingly, I always think, is that thanks to schemes that we run in the National Biodiversity Data Centre, like the All Ireland Bumblebee Monitoring Scheme, we know that the abundance of our common bumblebees has also declined, and that's been happening since we started measuring it in 2012. You know, so the rare species, they're disappearing through the loss of semi-natural habitats, really, and the common species are declining in abundance as a consequence of how we're managing the rest of the landscape. So I think if there's a problem, you know, what do you do? Well, I think you firstly have to decide if it's important to critically assess it and how serious it is identify what's causing it, and then collectively agree a framework to address it. And that's what the All Ireland Pollinator Plan really has been all about. And you, you might know that, that myself and Jean Stout and Trinity initially put together the first plan and then we called a steering group, you know, to develop it from there back in 2015. And I suppose just to say straight off that FIBCA, FIBCA have been representative on, on that group right from the very start, you know, and have made a hugely positive contribution. And huge thanks to Mary Monto for, you know, for all the work that she's done to help us with the plan. But once you have a plan, I think then you have to identify evidence-based actions to help. You have to communicate those properly. You have to work together where you can. And then you have to track progress. Is what you're trying to do actually working? So the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, you know, it's a call to action. These are our 99 different wild bee species. <clears throat> And if you want to help implement the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, it's important to think about how your site can provide food, shelter, and safety. And I always say that anyone who has any responsibility for a piece of land from the smallest window box to the biggest farm, you know, can play a role. And it's about thinking about your site, whatever it happens to be. And, you know, is it providing food, shelter, and safety for bees? And if you're doing that, you're helping to protect biodiversity generally. These are Ireland's wild bees. I know I've got a captive audience. I get to tell you about these instead of the honeybee. Um, so I just wanted to, to show you some of my favourite ones, I suppose. This one is called the gold fringed mason bee. It's a gorgeous little solitary bee species that um, only occurs on coastal sites and sand dunes. And it makes its nest in empty snail shells. You can see it there, it's collected bits of moss to, to make a nest in that, in that snail shell. Another one is this one, which is the tawny mining bee. This is again, you know, a gorgeous, vibrant, solitary species. 
Um, this one was extinct in Ireland for 87 years before it was um, rediscovered in 2012. And since then, it's it's been gradually expanding its range. I think it's, it's known from about six counties at the minute. So it's a spring species. So, you know, worth keeping an eye out for this over the coming months. And it makes its nest in, in bare soil. You get these little kind of volcanic like mounds where, where you can see the soldier bee nest. Another one is this one, the red mason bee that, that you may have come across. Um, and research has shown that one female red mason bee can do the pollination work of, you know, of over 100 honeybees, you know, which is incredible. And, and a beekeeper actually sent me a really cool little um, time series of, of a red mason bee nest. I just want to show it to you. I mean, it's interesting. So this is, you, you don't obviously normally get to see this, but they, it had formed in the hive and he was able to take photographs across, you know, a number of weeks. So you can see here, um, red mason bees uh, make the cells in their nest with mud. So the, the bee has gone out and collected um, mud, made these cells, you know, it's about 10 different cells there, and then it's collected pollen. And filled each one and, and you know as you know the, the different colors of pollen are from different plant species and then it lays an egg you know within each little food supply those eggs develop into larvae and they start eating the food supply that the mother has left uh, eventually they'll turn into pupae you know which will overwinter and then emerge as adults again the next year so again you know thanks to john fortune for sharing these pictures and you know it's, it's really interesting to see how a soldier bee nest evolves across the season and you can see you know it started out with 10 cells which is typical enough for a soldier bee in terms of the number of cells that a nest might have but you know it's it's finally ended up with six you know and, that, and that's what typically happens in nature that some of them don't don't survive <clears throat> we also had a new bee arrive in Ireland last year. So the ivy bee arrived for the first time. It was recorded from the Raven Nature Reserve in Wexford in uh, October. So it's lovely to see, you know, another addition to the to the bee fauna. But of course, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, we have lots of bees that are really threatened and on, and on the verge of extinction. And these two, you know, stunning bumblebees, the great yellow bumblebee and the shoal carter bee, both, you know, very threatened in Ireland. So while new things are arriving, there are also things um, that are in a great deal of trouble. And people will say, well, I'm sort of vaguely aware of soldier bees, but how important are they? And, and actually really important because they're very efficient pollinators. And I'll just explain why that's the case. So um, honeybees, as you know, and bumblebees, um, they store the pollen pellet on their hind leg and they store it as a moist or a condensed pellet. <clears throat> so they'll moisten it. And so it's a really kind of dense pellet on the back leg, which means, you know, they're really efficient at collecting pollen, bringing it back to the hive or to the nest. Most solitary bees, again, they store the pollen pellet on the back leg, but they don't moisten it. So they store it as a dry or sort of loose pollen pellet where they pack the pollen into the hairs on the leg. That's not as efficient as you can imagine. A lot more falls off, you know, as it moves from flower to flower, which means that more gets dispersed around the flowers, which makes it better pollinators. So, you know, soldier bees tend to be slightly more efficient at pollinating than, than bumblebees and honeybees, for example. And there's one particular group of soldier bees, <clears throat> the leaf cutters and the mason bees, so like the red mason bee that I just showed you, um, they haven't evolved to store pollen on the back leg, they store it on the underside of their abdomen. So they pack it into the hairs, you know, on the underside of the abdomen. It's totally inefficient, the pollen goes everywhere, you know, it takes about 10 times as many trips. But it means you know the pollen is dispersed really well around flowers, which which makes them you know very efficient pollinators. So these are the 99 bee species, you know, and they need food, shelter, and safety. And you know, I think it's all very well to ask people to help with that, but you have to explain to them what it is that you want them to do. So within the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, we've really tried to focus on developing evidence-based guidelines for different sectors. So you might have seen some of these, you know, there's one for schools, for farms, councils, local communities, businesses, gardens, and, and, and so on. And each time we identify actions that will help, that are evidence-based, so the science says that it'll work. We make sure that we liaise with the sector each time, you know, so we get a lot of feedback and we consult a lot with a particular sector, and we try to make sure that the communication is tailored to that sector. And all these are freely available on the website at pollinators.ie. There's another series of, of how-to guides for some of the more complicated actions. And then there's this third, I suppose, more specific series that we've started, you know, which is talking about you know, more, more site specific situations like golf courses, sports clubs, wind farms, and so on. 
Once we have these guides, what we've tried to do is to use existing networks and partnerships to encourage the implementation and rollout. And to be totally honest, we've never really developed a guide unless we knew that that structure was already in place to help us get it out when the guide would be available. So, you know, for example, with schools, we've worked a lot with green schools and eco schools in Northern Ireland, you know, with farms, you know, with, with the relevant partners. And each time we've tried to do that just to, I suppose, to efficiently roll them out and also to get buy-in. Mm -hmm. So we try to make all the information uh, accessible and freely available so you can get all this on pollinators.ie along with lots of videos, animations, you know, and the signage templates and, and, and so on. I want to, you know, there's lots and lots of actions that you can take to help pollinators and I don't talk about all of them, but I do want to mention two key ones. And these are both really important because they're helping to return habitats. And that is critical if we want to address this biodiversity crisis. You know, when you're returning habitats, those are sustainable and long term biodiversity actions. And there are two that are really important and that we tend to try to prioritize and focus on quite a lot. The first key action is in spring, you know, and that's to have more flower and native hedgerows and trees. And the second action is in spring, summer, and it's to have more native meadows. I'm just going to talk a wee bit about those those native meadows and that's you know the don't know let it grow approach that, that, that we talk about within the plan a lot and really just not cutting the grasses off and it is probably the best and cheapest way to help pollinators to be honest you can see in this picture there's three different types of grass cutting going on there there's cut regularly cut less frequently <clears throat> and cut once a year um you know yourself you know if you're bee you're not down with that but you love a bit of these two and it just shows, I think, how easy it is to provide food for pollinators. And we always say, you know, if you want these grassy areas to become more flourish on their own, you do have to take the cuttings away because that will gradually lower the soil fertility and give the wildflowers that are in the soil already a chance to grow and compete with those grasses. So we've got lots of resources to help people do this. You know, there's lots of different ways you can do it from, you know, full on meadows to just, you know, letting patches of clover grow, grow in your lawn. And really, I, I, I know I labour this point, but I think it's so important. Pollinators don't need anything fancy. You know, they need simple wildflowers, but they just need more of them. And it is things like dandelion and buttercup and clovers, you know, the cuckoo flower, birds foot trefoil, knapweed. They are so important, you know, to, to pollinators. We can see that within the National Biodiversity Data Centre when we get data submitted to us, which also tells us what the bee was feeding on. So when you do this, when you don't want to let it grow, you know, that's a biodiversity action. You're sustainably returning a really important grassland habitat and providing pollinators with the flowers that they need. You know, it does take patience. You know, you have to persevere with that. It'll gradually become more flower rich, but you do have to, you know, be patient. There's another action, I suppose, that some people tend to focus on, and that's buying packs of wildflower seed. And, and I suppose some people understandably think, well, maybe that's a better way to do this. And, you know, it, it really isn't so... Planting wildflower seed, that's, you know, that's not a biodiversity action, it's a horticultural action. And we always say, you know, if you want to do that, make sure you keep it within a garden setting and don't plant it in areas where those natural grass and habitats could be naturally returned. And really, when you buy a packet of wildflower seed mix, you know, you're growing a random mix of flowers that would never grow together in nature. Um, the industry is not regulated, you know, so it may not be native, it may not necessarily be good for pollinators. And, and we always say, you know, just bear in mind that that is a horticultural action and, you know, the don't want to let it grow approach, you know, is sustainably return a grassland habitat. So we just ask people to think carefully when they take these actions. So I want to tell you about some of the positive impacts that the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan has had to date. Um, so the first plan was published in 2015 and ran to 2020. And that plan had 81 actions, which we were, you know, able to deliver, thankfully. At this um, point, 86% of councils across the island have become partners and are taking action. You know, parks have become pollinator friendly through a special pollinator award in the Green Flag for Parks initiative. We have a framework for businesses where a company can sign up as a supporter and commit to taking action and reporting to us on, on what they're doing. And at the minute, you know, there's over 330 businesses that are doing that. We've got a, a research project within the National Biodiversity Data Centre that's working with a group of farmers based mainly around Kildare, and it's creating an evidence-based pollinator score for farms. So there's 40 farms across types and across intensity, intensity levels, 
And the idea with that project was to show that all farms, you know, regardless of the type or regardless of the intensity level, can become more pollinator friendly by taking simple actions. So we developed this whole farm pollinator score, which shows farmers how good their farm is and explains to them, you know, the changes they can make to improve that score. Probably the most successful sector, the sector that have done the most, I would say, are, are local communities. And we have a special pollinator award in the Tidy Towns competition, and you know, over 200 um, towns and villages have entered that award so far, which means they've taken, you know, really significant or made significant changes in their local area to make it more pollinator friendly. And some of the local communities, you know, just just do inspire and things for pollinators, you know, to be totally honest. Schools have become pollinator friendly and you know, we've got the junior version of the pollinator plan and also this how to guide on how to develop a pollinator plan for your school. And just recently you might have seen it, we have um, liaised with SuperValue to provide um, resources, essentially these um, to all, the SuperValue have sent them out to all primary schools across the Republic of Ireland, you know, which is 3,200, which is, which is fantastic. And it's great to get that reach and, you know, to get the, the message to the next generation. We have an online mapping system within the National Biodiversity Data Centre where anyone who takes an action can draw around their site and log what they've done. And to date, you know, there's over 7,000 actions that are logged and, and that builds all the time. We're seeing a lot more people engaging with nature, you know, which is fantastic. And, and since we launched the pollinator plan, the number of people recording wild bees and submitting the data to us has increased by 300%, you know, which is fantastic. It's also an Irish pollinator research network, um, which continues to grow and, you know, their work's so important because it underpins the advice that we're able to provide within the pollinator plan and helps us to ensure that we're always suggesting the best evidence-based actions for people to take. And again, you know, thanks to the, to the huge support that we've got and the buy-in across all partners, across all sectors, the, the pollinator plan has been regarded as a success story internationally and we, we have we get a lot of other countries reaching out to us, you know, to, um, to, to understand what we've done here and hope that maybe they can replicate some of it. We produced this little booklet at the end of the first phase. It's sort of tales from the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. I put the web link down there, but, you know, if people are interested, it's probably the hardest thing we did across the first five years, to be honest, because there's so many positive stories, thankfully, that, that we could have chosen from, but we picked about 80 just to put in this booklet to show the range of different actions that are happening right across all sectors. I mean, people can have a look if, if you're interested. Something else I suppose we wanted to do then as we were moving from the first phase really into the second was to address some of the issues that were arising. <clears throat> And obviously, you know, this is a normal part of, of, of a national initiative like this. But what we've always tried to do is identify these issues and to deal with them, you know, as, as they do raise their head. Um, one thing I suppose we've always tried to do is to balance the managed and the wild pollinators. And I want to I firstly pay tribute to all the beekeeping organisations across the island. We've all been just so supportive of, of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and, and not least FIBCA. So, and, and then they've been supportive of, you know, I think of, of this messaging as well. So what we want to do is make sure that there's a balance between the number of honeybees that we have and, and the wild pollinators, which we know are in a huge amount of trouble. And, you know, there is research, very active research area, but, you know, there's research going on that shows, you know, you can reach a stage where there are too many hives in the landscape and that can negatively impact on the wild pollinators. So I suppose we've discussed this a lot with, you know, the beekeeping representatives within the steering group and, and come up with, you know, things that we want to try and do moving forward on it. One, I suppose, is that the beekeeping associations, you know, mention wild pollinator conservation in your in your courses. And, you know, I know that, you, that you've always done that. I think sometimes what happens is that people decide they want to help pollinators and, and they think, oh, the best thing to do maybe is to get hives when they're actually not really interested in keeping bees, you know, that they, they've just mistakenly, you know, decided that's the best thing to do. So I suppose, you know, we're keen to just for those people, maybe they're shunted off, you know, and, and they take action in the garden for, for wild pollinators. And then the people who really want to take up beekeeping, well, they can be, you know, encouraged. We always, you know, say new beekeepers, you know, need to be liaison with their local association to make sure, you know, that they're help, keeping healthy honeybees. It's really clear, you know, we need more research on this in the Irish context, and that is happening. You know, there's studies in UCD in particular going on at the minute. But I think the consensus is, and there was a recent international conference on this in Denmark this year, 
which is suggesting we certainly need to know more, but the consensus is probably that we need to err on the side of caution and certainly, you know, we need to think twice about police and hides in national parks or in areas that are really close to rare and threatened um, wild species. The other thing we need to be really careful about is to avoid planting that can be detrimental to biodiversity. And again, a lot of these things, you know, happen almost accidentally or, you know, you know, it's not that any of it's necessarily deliberate. Um, but it is something I suppose that we need to always be conscious of and aware of. So that might be, you know, the wildflower seed mixes. The Dublin Naturalist Field Club have produced a really excellent position paper on this. I put the web link down there, which explains why these mixes can be so detrimental to biodiversity. And I think, you know, this picture really brings it home that, you know, you can see a really colourful flower bed really in that. But that's on a site where there's a you know, you would, there's a rare species that occurs in that area, the prickly poppy, which is a red listed um, native species in Ireland. But, you know, this has been probably sprayed and, you know, that makes planted in there in an area where you could have this really rare, you know, native plant. The other thing we need to be really careful about is, you know, not adding non-native trees when you're trying to restore, you know, purely native habitats. And, you know, the, I suppose the thing that we really need to be careful of are invasive species. And I suppose this is just the kind of the nightmare situation, for, certainly for ecologists, when you see things like Himalayan balsam stretching, you know, along riverbanks, um, instead of, you know, the beautiful and diverse riparian flora that should be there. So I just need to be careful in these situations. Also need to make sure, you know, that when we're suggesting wild pollinator nesting actions, that we're suggesting ones that are evidence-based. And really, you know, the easiest things are, Nests for bumblebees, they just need undisturbed long grass. With mine and solitary bees, they just need bare soil. You know, so very, very easy to provide those. Um, and then with cavity nesting bees, you know, they'll, they'll nest in existing cavities, whether it's in walls or masonry or hollow stems. But these are the ones that you can also help by adding the bee boxes. And, and I suppose we always just stress, you know, you don't need an enormous bee box, you know, smaller and just for solitary bees is better. And again, you know, people need to just bear in mind that it's only a very small number of species that will use these bee boxes, whereas most solitary bees, you know, are mining solitary bees and will be helped by creating areas of bare soil, or, you know, as I say, you can leave undisturbed areas of grass for bumblebees. So I want to just tell you now a wee bit about the new phase of the plan and some of the things that we're hoping to do. So we wanted this new phase to be more ambitious, but, but obviously still remain realistic. So this time around, we have six different objectives. The first one is on farmland and making farmland more pollinator friendly. Second is on public land. Then there's an objective on private land. This time, you know, and I'm thrilled that we were able to do this, we have an objective specifically on honeybees. So there's an All-Ireland Honeybee Strategy, which slots within the, the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. It's standalone, but it also slots within the plan. Um, we then have an objective on conserving rare pollinators and then one on strategic coordination of it. So we might have lost the run of ourselves. We went from, one, we went from 81 to 186 actions. Um, but, you know, I'm joking. You know, it's fantastic that we have been able to forge ahead and, and to identify, you know, a much wider range of actions for this new phase. And responsibility for those actions is shared out between all the partners who've, who've committed to them. And again, you know, the, the first phase of the plan, I suppose I work on this kind of part time because I look after other projects within the National Biodiversity Data Centre. The first phase of the plan, we just, it was just myself and then Juanita Brown, who some of you might know as, as you know, the full time project officer. Um, thankfully, this time around, you know, we've had government support for the second phase of the plan. So we've been able to take on three project officers. You know, so Kate Chandler is funded by National Parks and Wildlife Service and, you know, as the Communities and Engagement Pollinator Officer. We've got Ruth Wilson, funded by the Department of Agriculture, um, and she's a Farmland Pollinator Officer. And then we have Sarah Kelly, who's the Business Pollinator Officer, who's funded at the minute by Board BIA. So just to mention, I suppose, very briefly, some of the key things that we want to achieve in this next phase. So objective one is making farmland more pollinator friendly. And, you know, there's no doubt that this is an incredibly important one. We've got five targets, 26 actions, you know, lots of partners who've agreed to help deliver those. And as I say, you know, Department of Agriculture provided funding for a farmland pollinator officer, which, which is fantastic. 
So some of the type of things that we want to do, we want to do more direct engagement with those in the sector. We want to do more training, you know, with farm advisors and with farmers themselves. We want to develop more evidence-based resources for farmers. We want to do more to raise awareness by celebrating farmland pollinators and, and farmland biodiversity. And we want to better track changes, so monitor wild pollinators on farmlands. And we have a national pollinator monitoring scheme, which is kicking off in 2022 this year within the, the National Biodiversity Data Centre, um, which is going to monitor wild pollinators. Um, so bumblebees, solitary bees, um, and hoverflies, particularly across a network of 50 sites, a combination of farmland and public land and some urban parks. Objective two then is about making public land more pollinator friendly. And um, this, this is a big one. So there's 10 targets, 57 actions this time, lots of partners have agreed to, to help. And, and the National Parks and Wildlife Service have provided funding to assist with this one. And the kind of things that we want to do here is, I suppose, firstly, to ensure that everyone has taken the right action to help. We want to expand to new sectors. Um, so ideas there, you know, we want to expand to healthcare sites, to hospitals and the like, also to new housing developments. So we have um, some new guideline documents in train on those. We want to encourage more ecological corridors. There's lots of people taking action. We want to make sure that we can or as far as possible, that we can join those up to create corridors across the landscape for our pollinators. We want to recognise sites that have decided to go pesticide free. And we want to better explain, you know, the wider benefit of pollinator actions. We know that when we take action for pollinators, you know, it's helping biodiversity generally, but it's also helping climate and it's also helping our own health and well-being. And I think, you know, if COVID has, has taught us nothing else, it's the importance of nature to us, you know, to our own physical and mental health and to have places where you can connect with nature are so, so important. Objective three is on making uh, private land pollinator friendly. So again, this time six targets and 24 actions here. And the kind of things that we want to do again are to expand to new sectors. So within this new phase, we produce these guidelines for sports clubs in collaboration with the GAA particularly. And we're, you know, it's been really successful so far and, and trying to slowly roll that out. And it suggests, you know, simple actions that you can take around a sports club to make it to make it more friendly to bees and, and other insects. We want to keep using gardens as a general awareness reason tool. So we did launch this little initiative um, about this time last year, um, which asks people to pledge their garden for pollinators. So we've got resources, you know, of things that you can do each month and, and, and lots of different actions that you can take to help and we're asked people to, to pledge their garden. And then we want to grow and better support, you know, that network of business supporters. So say at the minute, there's about 330 and it increases all the time. So we want to encourage more companies to get involved and, and, and to take actions. Objective four then is the All-Ireland uh, Honeybee Strategy. As I say, you know, I'm thrilled that we were able to include this one this time around. Um, it's a standalone strategy, but slots within the wider plan and it has its own separate uh, steering group with representatives from all the beekeeping organisations and the Department of Agriculture, um, both sides of the border and, and so on. There's six targets and 23 actions, you know, say, you know, lots of partners, you can see them there. And the kind of things that we want to do, I suppose, mostly more collaboration. You know, the, the group has met a few times now in, and I'm not a honeybee expert remotely, but you know, I've been sitting in the group at meetings and it's fantastic, I suppose, to see the positivity and everyone working together and you know identifying the challenges and, and how do you move forward on them. So, you know, it is great, you know, even to be able to observe that happen. We also want to ensure, as I said before, you know, that that honeybees and, and bumblebees that we have a cohesive and balanced pollinator voice so that we are take an action to have a vibrant and healthy honeybee sector, but at the same time, you know, that that is balanced with the needs of the wild pollinators. And, you know, that's something that we've always done. And as I said before, beekeeping organizations have been so supportive of the plan and we're, and we're really grateful for that, you know, and I hope that we can continue working together on that, you know, as, as we move forward into this next phase. 
again, you know, within the All Ireland Honeybee Strategy, there's a lot of actions around healthy honeybees, and there are also actions around um, data collection. This time, for this phase of the plan, we, we, we decided to have a specific objective on rare pollinators. I suppose in the first plan, if, if I had to be critical, it's maybe that we didn't do enough on specifically on rare pollinators. So I'm delighted that we've, you know, we've got this objective this time. There's five targets and 12 actions, um, various organizations who'll help us deliver those. And the kind of things that we want to do are to publish best practice advice. So we have a few years ago, we published a guideline on uh, protecting the great yellow bumblebee, which is probably our most threatened bumblebee in Ireland. Um, really, was very, very restricted range now, and the only healthy populations are, are in the Mullet Peninsula. So, you know, this guide, you know, explains why it's in trouble, the kind of actions that it needs, and, and identifies ways that we can help it as we, as we move forward. So we want to publish more of these for, for other um, really rare pollinators. The next one coming out is going to be on a solitary bee called the Northern Caletes, which is a coastal species. I want to make sure it links to policy. So, you know, we have the red list of Irish bees and hopefully, you know, there can be a red list of, of hoverflies and, and that we can update the red list of bees, you know, when, when sufficient data is, is available. I want to raise awareness of rare pollinators. Um, and we want to better track changes. So, you know, I hope that's something that we can continue to do within the National Biodiversity Data Center. Objective six then is on strategic coordination. I see lots and lots of things in here that, that I suppose keep the whole thing ticking over um, and, and lots of organizations to help. Just a couple of the things that we hope to do. We want to really attempt to reach new audiences. And I, that's something that we started doing within the last couple of years, the first phase, you know, it's tempting to just speak to people who are already on board. We've tried to stop doing that and deliberately, you know, go out and speak to audiences who perhaps aren't aware of the plan or are less receptive to it. So that's something that we've, that we've been trying to actively do. There's also, as I say, the Irish Pollinator Research Network. They've identified a whole set of new research priorities to support this, you know, next phase, the 2021-25 plan. And also, you know, we plan to have a whole suite of, of support and databases, you know, that's national databases on, on rare pollinators, you know, on wild pollinator distribution, on plant pollinator interactions. So lots and lots of databases that we hold behind the scenes within the National Biodiversity Data Centre um, that provide the structure and the evidence base for, for a lot of what we do. And I suppose just, just finishing up really, I would say we didn't have to do a pollinator plan in Ireland. You know, it wasn't that the government said do do a plan. You know, we need one. It sort of came from the bottom up. So tracking whether or not it's working has always been an incredibly important part of it. And there's three ways that we try to do this. Um, the first one is to track implementation of the actions in the plan itself. So this time around, there's 186 actions, and the organisation who has responsibility has to report on what they're doing against the action each year, and we make that publicly available. That report. So the first report is on the website, you know, so you can see what happened against those 186 actions in 2021, um, and we do that each year. The second way that we track progress is we have this online mapping system called Actions for Pollinators. Um, and as I say, you know, you can go in and say, draw around your site and say, what it is that you're doing to help? And that helps us to track the creation of pollinator habitat right across the island. And the third way, and, and obviously the most important, is to track changes in the pollinators themselves. You know, this plan is only going to be a success if there are in 5, 10, 20, 100 years, you know, there are more bumblebees, there are more soldier bees, there are really healthy, vibrant honeybee sector. And that's what we need to track and make sure is actually happening. So we do this in, in various different ways. As I mentioned, there's a new national pollinator monitoring scheme starting. And we've always had citizen science initiatives that we've used to track what's happening with, 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 the, with the wild bees themselves. So we've got the bumblebee monitoring scheme and also this little scheme called Flower Insect Timed Counts. And I'll pay credit, you know, to the amazing volunteers who take part in both these schemes and, and really, you know, they're the bedrock and, and they provide the evidence base that tells us what's happening with, with bees, you know, and other insects in the landscape. So what they do actually is they allow us to see what's happening nationally, but these citizen science schemes in particular also allow groups and individuals to track the impact of their own action, you know, which I think is really important for people. 
So really just I coming towards the end, you know, there's no doubt that sustaining long-term participation with the All Ireland Pollinate Plan is, is going to be a challenge. Um, I think, you know, it needs to be built on trust and the experts that are running it. It needs to be built on acknowledgement of all the efforts that are being made. And really importantly, you know, there needs to be clear demonstrations that the actions we are taking together are making a difference and are having a positive impact. So I always say, you know, lots of small actions taken together can begin to solve big problems. And, and you know, it's so true. And we are so grateful to all the people who've engaged with the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and have taken action. Um, I want to pay tribute again to Fibka, who have been so supportive right from the very start. And, you know, it, it's fantastic to have you as part of this plan and as part of the steering group. So I'll stop there. Um, thanks again for, for inviting me today. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions if, if you have any. Okay, I'll have a look. Um, let's open the chat. The first one comes up about do you have any concerns about the use of a uh, set mid bridge by Quilta? I'm not sure if that's the only one they use, but I think they use Clotine on as well. Yeah, do you know, of course, the use of pesticides is concerned. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's kind of you know something that we constantly work on and try to move in a positive direction on that pesticide journey towards reduction in use and and, and, and ultimately towards elimination of, of some of them. So yeah, absolutely. What you can say really if, you, if they're spraying with that stuff. Um, actually, there don't seem to be any other questions. Does anybody else have any, any questions? Oh, here's one of them. Q&A. Yeah, here's one. What can I do to help pollinators in my little garden in County Tipperary? Yeah, you, lots of things. I suppose I always say that the most important thing is don't mow that it grows. So if there's an area of your grass that you can reduce mowing, so don't cut so often, you know, let dandelions grow at this time of year. Maybe take part in, we've got an initiative called No Mow May, where we encourage people not to mow the grass in May. And it's, you know, it sounds simple, but really it has such a positive impact because it lets little flowers like clovers and birds with trefoil grow amongst the grass and, and provide food for pollinators. So that's one thing you can do. Something else obviously is, you know, don't use chemicals in the garden. And the third thing then is when you're buying garden plants, you make sure you know that you're choosing ones that are rich in pollen and nectar. We've got lots of lists on the website of those, or, you know, I usually go to the garden centre and hang around for a wee while and see which plants or see which ones the bees themselves are visiting while you're there. And, you know, that's a good sign that it's, you know, one that's going to be useful. What was the name of the new hundredth bee? And do we yeah. know where it came from? Yeah, so the hundredth bee is called the ivy bee. So it arrived in October. Um, it's really interesting, solitary bee, it's been on the move uh, northwards in Europe, so it reached Britain um, probably in the last 15-20 years, and what happens is that once populations in Britain reach sufficient density and there's a, a prevailing wind in this direction, they'll, they'll be blown across on, you know, onto the Irish coast, usually um, into Wexford or, or, or the east coast somewhere. So the ivy bee um, came across, was blown across from Wales into Wexford in, in October. Um, so it's a, it's the latest solitary bee that we have. So it you know a very very late flight period um, to coincide with its food plant, which is ivy. So yeah, lovely, really distinctive solitary bee. So you know once it gets um, its foot in Ireland, you know it'll you know I suspect we'll see it commonly on ivy across the country. Um, are there any training sessions in Dublin, in fact, probably anywhere in the country, on all aspects of uh, types of insects, trees, plants, et cetera? Yeah, so we run um, a really active biodiversity training program within the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Now, we used to do this pre-COVID times. We'd have 20 or 30 different workshops every year that you can, you know, we'd release a list at the start of the year and you could book onto them. So we're slowly getting back to that. Um, we're not back up to you know, the numbers that we would like yet, but we are back doing biodiversity workshops on all aspects of, of biodiversity. As mentioned there, you know, I'm going to one on bumblebees in May, I think, you know, and there's, there's lots of other ones on various different plants, insects, coastal biodiversity, and so on. So if you just look on biodiversityireland.ie and uh, training courses, you'll, you'll find you know, what, what we're doing there. Um, is there a local biodiversity office or officer in Dublin? 
Yeah, there's a really active biodiversity officer in, in Dublin City. Um, and you can find all those people on the website. If you search, you know, biodiversity and heritage officers, you'll see um, who the local one is for your area. But there is a biodiversity officer in Dublin who, you know, does fantastic work and actually has been very, very supportive of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Um, in the long term, would there be any monetary incentives to farmers who buy into this plan in a big and serious way? It's a really good question. And, you know, I said farming is the most important sector and we have to be able to positively influence farms when it comes to pollinators and wider biodiversity. Um, we're really excited about the project that we're running in the National Biodiversity Data Centre at the minute. You know, it's based us in Kildare. We're working with this group of 40 farmers. And I suppose it's a privilege, you know, being able to develop the project with them to identify actions that work for the farmer and that also work for nature. So these the actions that we've identified, you know, don't impact the farm as a business, but they are positively impacting pollinators and other biodiversity. And within that project, as I say, we've worked out this whole farm pollinator scoring system. So depending on you know how much farm and hedgerow the farmer has, what pesticides they use, and you know whether they have you know clover meadows and, and so on and so on, they get a score. And then the higher their score, the more they're paid each year. And really the engagement has been incredible. We've done extensive pollinator surveys across all 40 of those farms to show, you know, what pollinators they currently have, you know, to show that the scoring system works. And really, you know, that's been so positive. And I suppose we need more initiatives, I think, like that, that wider scales. We are recognizing the contribution that farmers are making. You know, you're not asking them to do anything that's going to be costly to them. And you're getting them to do things that are definitely going to work and that they're going to be asked to do in the long term. So I suppose the idea with that project is that we would be able to come out with really good evidence based advice for a mechanism to make all farms more pollinator friendly. And, you know, I, I hope, you know, as that project comes to an end, that we will be able to extend it out to, to a much greater number of farms than the 40 currently in the pilot. So that looks like it's the end of the question. Just check. Oh, there's another one. Uh, would it be possible for a biodiversity trading session for community groups in a city environment? Yeah, so we do training sessions in lots of different um, situations. We've often, you know, run lots within the cities, particularly in Dublin. And, you know, within the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, we also run training sessions on, on the actions that you can take with local communities to help pollinators. We've done a lot of those with tidy towns groups, you know, both in cities and, and, and in, in, in more rural areas. So yeah, you know, absolutely. And I suppose if you keep an eye on the National Biodiversity Data Centre's website and also pollinators.ie to see what we're up to, you know, you'll see if there are any coming up. Um, so uh, if a farmer here in West Cork wanted to be actively involved in your plan, who should they contact? Yeah, so the, I suppose the first thing that is probably good to do is just have a look at the website and click on the link for farmland and you'll see the kind of actions that we suggest taken. And there's little videos and things on there, you know, we've got farmers talking about how they manage their hedgerows for, for biodiversity for pollinators and so on. So that will give you a good idea of the kind of actions that we suggest. We're developing, you know, additional resources all the time around that. And also then feeding information that we're learning from that research project and, you know, based in Kildare and the findings that we're learning from that. In collaboration with farmers we're trying to, you know, encourage and push that out to, to the whole farming community. So I suppose the first thing is maybe just, you know, have a look at the website and then, you know, send us an email if you if you want to, you know, go on on, on specific mailing lists. There's there's a mailing list for that farmland project, you know, so that means you'd, you'd get you'd get the monthly newsletter and and and. and you know, regular updates. Um, then there's a question, are there biodiversity workshops for kids as well? Mm, no, and you know, I wish there were, and we get asked to do an awful lot of stuff with schools. But I suppose because we're a small team within the National Biodiversity Data Centre, we're a small team within the Alarm and Pollinator Plan, we just don't have the capacity, unfortunately. So we have developed a lot of resources for children on the website. You know, there's lesson plans, there's the junior pollinator plan, there's how to make your school pollinator friendly. Um, but, but really we're not able to physically go out and do workshops ourselves, unfortunately, just, just due to the capacity issues. I think that's it. Oh, 
<laughs> Here's one that I, how was the Asian hornet situation? Um, well, I suppose it remains worrying, but um, I think that beekeepers are, are, you know, doing a fantastic job and working with, with this other stakeholders to make sure that we're keeping an eye out for it. And that really is the, you know, is the critical thing. We just need to be really, really vigilant. Um, I think it's been working successfully so far, but you know, that, yeah, you, you know better than I do, you know, the seriousness of that situation. So really vigilance is, is the way forward within the National Biodiversity Data Centre. You know, my colleague Colette O'Flynn, you know, has done a lot to put in place the mechanisms that need to be there so that, you know, once, you know, I hope it's not spotted, but when it is, you know, we can we can deal with it really, really quickly within Ireland. But yeah, it remains worrying, but yeah, as positive as it can be. So what we seem to have now left are thank yous, and I would echo that. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you from, from the attendees as well. So uh, nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, good luck with the, with the, with the, the plan anyway. Thanks. And thanks for inviting me again. And, okay, and thank you everybody for, for coming along. Right, thank you. Good evening.